blank has two sides, one's A, one's B. If you have two A's, they will not talk to each other, two B's won't talk to each other. It has to be an A and a B side. And that's the I have two different? Yes. So one is a high band, one is a low side. The A is gonna be your low side transmitter and the B is gonna be your high side transmitter. When you do a model command, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see the ODU detector first of all, and then you're gonna see the actual frequency ranges you can input for that. Okay. Questions on anything from yesterday? No? You guys wanna ace the test? Perfect. Of course. <laughs> Easy one. <money. laughs> okay, so as we've been talking about here, the training, the one thing I need you to learn, even if you don't take anything from this training, put it on the bench, you guys, you guys ready to go. You guys know you pass the test. So yes, when you get your beer, it's gonna be pre-configured by Triangle, based on your PCN, which is a licensed gear, a licensed link. First you wanna do, you wanna take it out of the box, put it on the bench, power up. Remember, Triangle radios can be powered up via PoE and direct power from all outdoors. Try both. Get a negative 48 PC, plug it in, get the PoE, swap them between each other, make sure it powers up the radio. For the indoor units, you only get the Regnick 48. For bench testing the actual radio, when you get it from Triangle, take it out of the box. If you don't have attenuators, you have to do a poor men's bench test. The way to do that is either you put them on top of each other, put a rim of paper, that's the best attenuator you can have. If not, put them three or five feet apart, also works decent enough. You will have reflection and bounce all over the place, but to for test modulation, 1024, 512, it'll work. All you wanna do is do a ping across. You wanna make sure you can talk across the link, send traffic. When you're on the bench, lower the actual power of the transmitters. You don't want to have all full power. It's not going to hurt the radio, but it's going to overdrive the transmitter. So you're probably going to get a really um, bad RSSI. If you lower the power, you're going to get a little better signal. Uh, verify from the web interface or the CLI, the radio link lock. So one thing I'm going to show you guys as well, physically, we can tell if the radio is locked or not. In the all outdoor models, it's gonna be a little hard to see, but where that direct connector is, the negative 48 power connector, when you turn it on, right on the bottom of that is gonna be a bright green LED. That LED has two purposes. It's a link-like indicator. When you first boot up the radio, it's gonna be solid. That means booting up. After the boot up process, it's gonna flash. When it's flashing, that means it's transmitting and it's ready to receive as well. When it's solid again, that means you have a link lock. So physically, you can actually know if the radio is locked or not. What is this good for? Alignment purposes. If you have a, you're aligning the radio, and you're moving it back and forward, you can see when the actual radio locks. That at least gives you an idea that you're in the ballpark, you're close to the actual alignment range. Okay? That's on the all outdoor product. In the split systems, you have two LEDs to indicate this. One is the ODU indicator, the other one is the link indicator. The ODU indicator tells you if the ODU has power or not. If it's green, do not take the end connector off. If it's amber, you can disconnect it safely. When it says link, if it's green, it's a lock. If it's amber, it's no lock. So we have physical physical uh, aspects that can help us see if our link, radius link or not. Um, then config save and reboot very file settings. Config save and reboot. It's on the bench, you're playing with it. Remember, if you change anything, you send it out to the, to the tower sites, and you forgot to actually config save, when they get there, they're not gonna work. You have to make sure after the reboot, they come back and make a link work. I know that on our previous products, and I keep going back because a lot of you guys have Apex Pluses, Giga Pluses, before we had a setting called default out mode, right? If that was set to off, when it rebooted, it would not transmit. In the new radios, it's already enabled by default. There's no way it would not come up transmitting, unless it was shut off, turn off transmit, out mode off. So that's a good thing. So again, most important thing, 
When you get your gear, put it on the bench, please. I don't want to give the call. Jose, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Perfect. What's the problem? It doesn't power on. It doesn't link. Did you test it before you put it up? Yeah, I got to call you back. Okay? So, please. Come on, guys. <clears throat> Something to consider here, just on outdoor models and split systems. For the all outdoor models, in all our radios, the Ethernet cable must be shielded cable okay, for the ground and the grain. Uh, I would not recommend going above 250 feet. Keep it 250 feet and below. The radios are not standard PoE 803.11 AF, and that's a good point I want to make. Um, if you grab one of our radios and you try to connect it to a PoE switch from Cisco, Netgear, Brocade, uh, even a PoE injector from any brand, it's not going to power up. Okay, so it's not AF. You have to use it. You have to use a particular PoE injector. For the split systems, use negative forty-eight triangle power supplies. It is recommended. I know in telecom there's big power supplies. I think. Who makes um, Smith Power? I think makes one. Um, who else makes one? Uh, APC. A APC. Yeah. Now it's negative forty-eight. It doesn't mean you can cross the wires and it's going to be net forty-eight. It has to be actually a net forty-eight power supply. Okay. Even if it's DC, there's there's rules to this. So which is a negative forty-eight power supply. Right. Okay. Connect the IF cable to the IDU before power up. So right now, I'm safe to go ahead and connect and disconnect and pinch my cable on the top of the ground and bolt every time I want to. Right, because there's nothing going to power the audio. But if I power up the IDU and then plug it in, I run the risk of creating a short circuit on the IF cable. If the center connector touches the outer connector, the IF cable is going to make it short and I'm going to blow my end connector fuse here. If I do that, the only way I, can ha I have to check it is I turn audio power on I grab my multimeter, put the center connector in the middle, and then on the outer part, the grounding, it has to read negative 48. If you don't have a negative 48 voltage on that end connector, it has to come back to the factory. Okay? Do not disconnect or connect the IF cable while the device is in operation. Again. Golden rule, IF cables are only supposed to be connected and disconnected when there's no power going to the OD. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to move into today's agenda. I'll give you a chance, you guys. Any questions? <laughs> uh, before I forget, yes, that uh, that radio is shifting about 130 times a day. Yeah, that's not really good. Yeah. Clear skies. I mean, every day is different. <laughs> I'm sure the last couple of days we've had some smoke, and fires, and whatnot. But... All right, we'll check the uh, ATPC power and see if that has to do with it. Because remember, I told you that if you said the RSSI. Target RSSI, if it's not the correct one, ATPC may be powering up and down the radio. So let's try that later. Okay. Understood. Well, please. Just to make sure when we're testing with the with the voltimeter. Yes. Uh, that's the one where you don't touch the, the pins on the voltimeter or it damages the IDU? It damages the end connector in the IDU. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not the IDU itself. So only here. The IDU is still gonna power on, you can get access to it. You can do whatever you want management-wise. Change IP, SNMP traps, uh, passwords, everything's gonna work. The only thing that's not gonna work is your OE. Now, see that fuse here that is right here? This is to protect the actual IDU itself. If there's a negative 48 discharge here, or for some reason um, uh, it gets a really heavy load, it's gonna protect, it's gonna break the fuse, okay? There's a diode inside as well, protection diode. So if you invert the actual uh, DC, negative 48, put the power on the ground and ground the power, you will not burn it up, it will protect it. Is that fuse field replaceable? Yes, it's a standard. Uh, GMT, isn't it? You know, it's a bus fuse. It's a little bus. It's a bus. Yeah, it's a little bus. Just like in your POE. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's a little bus round. You can buy them any hardware store. Also on the POEs, the new ones and the old 
this guy's here as well. Inside, there's an extra fuse for each purpose. All right, so today's agenda. Typically, what John tells you and what I tell you is a little different all the time. Uh, link commission and validation, we're going to talk about. We already know how to manage a radio, test a radio. Um, Traffic-wise, we know how to log into them, web interface, CLI. You guys are expert in the CLI. I know you look at me with Cisco eyes, like, you know, CCMP, CCIE, all that. Um, now we're gonna talk about, once we get our link up and running, what do we need to know to commission the link, okay? After that, we're gonna jump into network monitoring with Triangle NMS and PRTG. Uh, maybe I'm gonna leave Triangle NMS to John. He likes to do that. Give the guy, John. Uh, and I'd probably take a PRTG. Let's see how it looks. Uh, so SNMP for monitoring, this is one of the most important topics as well. The reason why, because when you get a link up and running, it could be passing traffic all day long, day and night, no problems, but you need to monitor your link. You need to see what's happening on the RF level and traffic wise as well. First of all, RSSI, MSC, and VERs. If the RSSI goes up and down, something's happening. Power, interference, your MSC goes down, what's happening, okay? If there's bad weather, you can see ACM shifting up and down. Traffic-wise, you have to monitor the ports. How much traffic am I passing through my Ethernet? Now, besides that, you can monitor uh, packet statistics, temperatures. Um, there's a number of parameters. I recommend 10 always. You also you don't want to do you don't want to stress the radio too much, grabbing parameters all the time. A recommended pull time is 60 seconds per parameter. IBM configuration and network setup. I know that IBM is pretty basic and you guys already know it in OBM so you know the difference and you can actually enable it. So the thing here for IBM is we're going to see how to enable IBM with a tag set on, <coughs> with a tag. on the network side what do we need in our switch? What do we need to declare? If it's a Cisco, uh, a large trunk, VLAN, 802.1Q, things like that. Firmware upgrade. There's two ways to do a firmware upgrade on the radio. Yeah, TFTP or FTP. It's the CLI. There's no way around it. Maybe down the line, if I said maybe, we'll think about web interface. Right now, everything is ground. So the main difference is TFTP is going directly from your local computer to the radio. FTP, you can either pull it from RFTP server and triangle or from your local server as well on your network. It's up to you. FTP has a checksum at the end, so it will be a little more, well, it's more secure, and it's, if it's, a, if the file is complete, it will tell you, if it's not, it will tell you, look, I didn't get a complete file. TFTP, it's a toss, right? It's not, a, it's a um, connection protocol, so really, you, can, you don't have any confirmation that the, the file actually got to the destination. You will get, okay, I got the file, but that's it. In what state, what size, I don't know. I just know I received the file. However, with that said, TFTP is really practical. Because sometimes you're in the tower, you just connect to the radio, or you have access to the radio via your network. If you can ping it, you can TFTP. Okay? Is it, I mean, you may go into more detail about this, but can you answer a question about that? Yeah. <laughs> so does the does the Trango software do a CRC check or an MD5 or something just to know that before it goes and puts that software in there that, yeah, that's a, that's a legit that's that's legit or does it just go you know you said it's good i'm gonna boot and i'm gonna die uh, no so that, yeah so there's a check well there's a um, md5 so what happens is you can you can push any file to the radio and by that i mean a text file uh, a bin file anything you want when you execute the actual firmware when you do the boot image command there's the most important check if it is not designed for that radio it will just start and it will kill the process so you cannot break the radio basically that so it'll tell you that before you're rebooting into that thing. Yes. So basically it checks that that software is legit mm -hmm. for that model and it's a good copy before it attempts to boot from it. Correct. So it's not like it's going to check when it's booting up and go, you're screwed, have a good time, come to the mountain. Yes. Yeah. But with that said, remember we have SF24E and non-encrypted. So let's just check on that model. That's the only thing there's, I want to touch base on that. On the license gear, it's a little more difficult to break the radio via firmware. On the unlicensed, I have people that have by mistake loaded the SF24E to the unencrypted. It will still boot up, it will not lock, and it will create weird behavior. But 
the same the checksum is the same for that specific model. This is the same platform. For the other ones, you have a specific variety of which platforms. So it's a little different. Okay. So we'll go more into detail of that. I mean, we're gonna actually do a firmware outbreak and you guys will do it as well. My favorite subject, lunch. Okay. I ace that class all the time. Then we'll have a factory visit. So you guys are gonna go see the RSNT assembly. You're gonna get to see how we actually build the IDU, uh, build the OMU. We do not build ODUs, okay? None of the microwave manufacturers do. It's, I think nobody actually does it. Uh, ODUs are third party manufacturer. We only manufacture the OMUs and the IDUs, okay? With that said, sparing purposes depends on availability of the ODU. Uh, we do fabricate everything here, we assemble it, so they're made in the US. Visio stencils. I know you guys have big networks, and I mean drilling infrastructure, towers going probably through states, um, a lot of miles. Uh, one way to have track of them is either your SNMP monitoring, however, you also want really nice documentation of it. So having Visio files from our IDUs and OEUs is really a really nice way to have a nice document with IPs, with labels, and everything really nice and clear. This helps either your integrator, your install, your install guys, fuel guys, to just have a good actual documentation for this purpose. On the Visio stencils, we already have pre-made for you 18 inch racks, just drag and drop. Get a CPA, get a APC rack just from Visio, you can drag and drop. Power supplies, everything. So it's really nice and it's free. Then link configuration practice. So this practice is here when we're going to go through all what we've been talking about yesterday and today. We're going to look at the radios. They may have problems, may have problems, right? Somebody may go in there and they didn't keep to the training and they don't know what they're doing basically. So they may, you know, change the things or two on the radio and you're going to have to fix it. And a lot of times, I'm going to give you a little heads up here. A lot of times it's not because you don't know what you're doing. I had people here, 35 people in the class, and they're right next to each other, and the problem is they don't communicate. That's the number one thing. You can be doing everything correct, checking you know, the frequencies, checking speed, checking um, SPIC stats, PLA stats, but the problem is you don't talk to each other right next to each other. Imagine you know, tower sites away. So you have to communicate with the other team to really get this running. Just keep that in mind. Uh, and then, we will send you passing tests. Right? What, uh, what time do you guys usually wrap? Oh, uh, typically, typically, it depends on the uh, on the size of the class. A small class, we can go a little more. Um, I figure around four o'clock, uh, maybe. The link configuration practice, it's a small group, so I think it's gonna go really fast, um, unless somebody really messes up the radius. But if it, that's the last um, practice for us. We finished with that. So, okay. and then troubleshooting. Troubleshooting, literally, I just glance at it because all the troubleshooting you're gonna do first here, hands on, is what you're gonna see on the field. So now we just go through the actual slides and say, well, remember when this happened to you? This is what you have to do. So you already been, did the process, now you're gonna realize why. And lastly, QA. So four o'clock, four-ish, uh, depends on you when we finish, but uh, typically it's before four. Yeah. So the exam is just somewhere wedged in there? Yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so. We all wanna be successful. Yeah, of course. Okay guys, uh, again, the support portal from triangle, support.trianglesys.com. You can come here and you will find everything for each radio, software, um, firmware upgrades, how-to guides, SNMP MIPS, anything you can find, question on the radio is gonna be here in this support portal. And you can have a ticket from here. You have to, is that something you have to register for? Uh, yes, yeah, just put in your email address and then you pretty much get a user. Okay. So you can have a history of tickets. Okay. Can you actually go through and review your tickets? Mm -hmm. in there? Okay. Yes, the history, yes, you can have that link up there, check your system request. Oh, all right. So your account is going to have how many times you interact with us, and then you can go back and uh, do follow-ups as well. On it. For example, let's say you fix something and you think it's not really fixed, you can go and say, hey guys, let's take a look at this again. 
Không thể thả Alright, so just to recap again When we're troubleshooting a length configuration What do we need to check first? Frequencies, transfer and receive, right? My TX has to be the yard to the far side Frequency duplex has to be the same TX power What happens if I have different TX powers on each side? One The yard the same signal will, Correct It will lock It could lock It will lock But the RSSI will be probably 10 dB soft depending on the difference between dBs Oh, okay So, the reason I say this is because, again Antenna alignment problems is symmetrical RSSI loss If you have negative, for example, 44 and one antenna moves ever so slightly both sides are going to move up so you want to 55 and 60 but it's symmetrical if you have a situation where some antennas has a negative 60 negative 32 mm -hmm. oh boy either power or something else is going on interference polarization cross pole things like that but a sure sign of alignment it's symmetrical other side uh, destruction if not typically the power how symmetrical is it like within a dB of each other? Uh, or when exact? Running? It's almost exact. I mean, almost, really, it's really, yeah. really, okay. really precise. Okay. And when you do the cross pole, you're going to see 20 dBs exact. It's going to be phase. So you will see the actual 20, uh, 40, 60, 50, 70. You will see it. And you got to go up the tower, unclip the ODU, turn it, and it's going to be fixed. And this is, I probably will never do this, but I mean, there's no reason that. An, an Orion couldn't talk to a uh, link. Uh, could I mean? They, I mean, are, is is there a, is there anything that would keep that from happening? Like, if you, if you had to do a, for some dumb reason, you had to be split system on one end and all outdoor the other. Would they? Will they talk to each other? What will they lock? They will lock to each other. We recommendation from Triangle is keep it the same. Yeah. Of course. Now, when you said Orion links, think no. We have to have a links, links, Orion, Orion. The reason why because the feature was one of the other different. Uh, but yeah. As long as you have, for example, one outdoor Orion and one split Orion, that's possible. Okay, but cross platforms it won't really work. Because of uh, incompatible features between them. Correct. XPIC and PLA, or yeah. no binaries. Yeah. On the past part, on the past products, for example, people wanted to do Apex Plus with Apexes, things like that. I would recommend uh, having the same platform just because of ease of use. Sometimes you get a little bug in the software, so just keep it the same. Yeah. Then we're going back, uh, TX power, transmitter on or off, channel bandwidth. Again, channel bandwidth is the key here. It's really easy to overlook this, but channel bandwidth, if it's 160, 120, that's enough to have a good RSSI, screaming RSSI actually, but it will not lock. <coughs> okay. Min and max modulation, have to be the same. ODU power on or off. Okay, link commission validation, 